It was okay. I, I, did it, I, I did it all in a mixer, so I didn't get my hands sticky. That very smart. Very smart. Sensible. Huh. Oh, Sylvia hasn't started yet. Sylvia says, oh, get it. Oh, sorry, Sylvia. Yeah, no, you can. The scalding itself needs to happen, obviously, sometime before because the dough has to cool down. You don't want to put super hot. Um, mm -hmm you know, water or, or a mixture into dough because you might kill the yeast. So, you know, every single week I seem to forget something off of that invitation. And this time I forgot to say to people who maybe haven't joined us before that when you join us, you should be needed with your bulk fermentation or the rising in the bowl done. So what we do in the class is we shape together. But I do always want to talk to you about your kneading experience because <laughs> Sometimes the dough is really dry, sometimes the dough is really soft, and this time what we have is a pretty sticky dough. So hang on one second, I'm gonna put my teacup down. So the reason the dough is sticky is because you have added a whole bunch of sticky block into the dough, and that's either the scalded wheat, okay. which has this kind of gummy, chewing gummy texture, or the scalded rye, which just has the texture of porridge or like super thick wallpaper paste if you've ever done wallpapering or kind of, you know, instant mashed potato. Does anyone have that childhood horrible memory of instant mashed potato from being at school or being at camp? It's exactly that texture. So the interesting thing about the scalded rye, let's focus on that for a second. And I asked you last time to really remember the texture of that scalded rye. And the reason is because, um, well, as you know, rye has gluten, but it's got a different structure of gluten to wheat. Okay, so it doesn't have the stretchy gluten that wheat has. And the reason I wanted you to remember the texture of the rye is because you can sub in anything. Okay, you can sub in mashed potato. You can sub in scalded millet, or you can sub in uh, porridge oats that you've soaked or leftover oatmeal that you have. You, if you're someone who likes kasha or buckwheat, if you're kind of coming from the East, you could sub in cooked buckwheat. Um, you can sub in oh. cooked rice. So you can kind of, you know, kind of clock the ratio of what's the total weight of that scalded rye, X. And what's the total weight of flour I have in the new batch, Y. You can use those proportions and substitute for the rye just remember that texture. And the reason is because different kinds of flour absorb different amounts of water. So if you wanna use millet, for example, and millet flour is super delicious, you need to use less flour and more water because millet is really, really, really absorbent. It will absorb at about six times its weight, whereas rye will absorb it at three times its weight. So, you know, just, literally experiment with different kinds of scalded grains. And I do include oatmeal porridge or rice or kasha um, because they're super yummy, they're super nutritious, and there is a historical reason for this. Around the world, you know, wheat flour in certain parts of the world still is, but certainly used to be very expensive, very difficult to come by. And so people have always padded out their bread with the thing that's kind of starchy and less expensive than wheat flour. So we have rice bread that comes initially from Indonesia. Okay, the Dutch settled Indonesia, colonized, didn't settle, colonized Indonesia. And the Dutch wanted to eat bread, but they had to take all of their wheat flour with them. So in order to stretch it and make it go farther, they put in rice. There's a very traditional bread. It's black rice bread or rice bread from Indonesia. It comes from the Dutch settlers from you know however many hundreds of years ago in my part of the world they would add traditionally they would have added cooked sweet potato um cooked yucca in order to kind of pad out that very expensive and rather rare wheat flour until people started growing wheat scotland they added lots of porridge oats there were lots of oats that mm -hmm. tradition came over to eastern canada uh northeast of the united states they add cooked cornmeal lots of corn not very much wheat. So they yeah. added cooked yeah. cornmeal porridge. Um, down in the Caribbean, in the north part of South America, they would add breadfruit. Okay, it's this thing, it's called breadfruit. And it's mushy and you would cook that and add it. So kind of anything starchy you can add, just look at the proportions of how much glop you added 
to how much new flour and you've got something that will be super yummy. It's always going to be sticky to me because you're adding gloppy stuff. And that's the same thing with sourdough. Sourdough is always stickier to knead because you have a proportion of refreshed sourdough, which is kind of gloopy, that you're adding to the flour. So always expect the texture to be different. And remember, that's okay. Okay, so different kinds of bread are going to have different kinds of dough. Never try to go for a particular dough unless it's a recipe you've done before. And then you can say, oh, last time I really liked it and the dough felt like this. So that's what I made it for. Okay, lecture on dough over. I'm going to move on. Can I ask something? So, yes, of course. If, if it's super sticky, how would you suggest kneading it then? Because it's quite difficult to do it with your hands. It's a great question. So I'm going to kind of demonstrate. Let me turn, let me pull that down. There we go. So the best thing, I'm gonna pull out my, my the rye, which is here. Okay, here's the rye, the scalded rye. The best thing to do is have a scraper handy. Yeah. Let me okay. take off my watch. And it's the same with when I when I make you do, and soon we're, I'm gonna make you do brioche, and it, it's hilarious doing brioche by hand, simply. So the best thing to do is to push and scrape. This now, it isn't gonna exactly do it, right? Because it's rising. But basically what you wanna do is you wanna push with your hand, and scrape it back with the scraper. Get it off your hand. Push with your hand. Always use the heel of your hand. Keep your fingers free. If you get your fingers involved in sticky dough, you're gonna lose half of your dough. Just trying to get it out from between your fingers and it's super irritating. So just use the heel of your hand, push and gather. Push and gather. And then every once in a while, you just have to scrape it off the heel of your hand. Is that helpful? Yeah, 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 no, it seems like it makes sense, yeah. Great, Jane, so when it comes to brioche, same technique, push and gather. Brioche is a whole separate issue, because as we've discovered before, um, with brioche, you'll end up having like a lake of butter on your table, and don't panic, because it will be absorbed. Okay. Jane, Jane I have another question. If, yeah. Um, it said to rise for two hours. I, I'm always very cautious. We have a very cold kitchen. Stuff doesn't rise in the time it's supposed to. There was no kind of guideline as to how big it was supposed to get. Which dough? Which dough? The rye or the either of them? It just said leave to rise for a set amount of time. It didn't. Yeah. Kind of they, dough, okay. Whenever you're dealing with dough, it's a great question, and I should remember to include that. Um, you're always looking for it to kind of double in size. Yeah. Okay. No, and the more rye content you have, yeah. the, 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 the less it's going to look like wheat. If you have an image of wheat, this doughy, puffy wheat yeah. in your mind's eye, rye will always get airy, but not so puffy because the rye gluten isn't stretchy. Okay. So the higher the rye content you have, the less it's going to double in size. Okay. And the more you have in there to weight it down, like fruit or nuts or seeds or scalded dough, the <laughs> less it's going to rise. Okay, so great. kind of the theory is double in size. Brioche is triple in size. And it's amazing. You'll see it when we do it. Yeah. But the heavier the dough, the kind of, but it should certainly visually change. Yeah. No, no, no. That's fine. Okay. Great. What, I, what I found, because I've been having trouble getting, because my kitchen's cold, um, and it hasn't been rising, it's been taking forever. So I put the light on, on in the oven, yep. just the light, and, and that's made all the difference today. Which is fantastic. And now it's great if you have a light that emits heat. A lot of super modern ovens have LED lights, no heat. Right, that won't work. So, so if, but if you have an oven and the light is a nice old fashioned light bulb that emits heat, it's a perfect place for bread to rise. Yeah. I'll put perfect. it in a lower perfect. setting. Sorry? Or put it at a lower setting, maybe, the oven? You have to be careful. Some ovens have literally have a dough setting. Okay. A super modern electronic oven has a dough setting. But, you know, you don't ever want it much over 27, yeah. right? Because you don't want the dough to rise too quickly either, especially when you're dealing with rye. Rye likes a cold climate. So in the summer, don't even bother trying to make 100% rye bread unless you can put it in the refrigerator to proof because <laughs> anything over 26 or 27 degrees and rye underperforms in a very spectacular way. It, it rises too quickly and collapse. So it's super interesting. 
you know, the kind of ideal temperature for bread to rise is between 20 and 24 degrees Celsius. But, you know, if you're doing it at room temperature or kind of five degrees in the fridge, but so you just, it's all a bit of a movable beast. Okay, the first thing we're going to work with, for those of you who did both, we're going to start with the Hong Kong pineapple buns. Okay, Jonathan, you ready? <laughs> Good. So let me get the dough. Okay, so here's Owie. Here's my dough. Okay, so I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll tilt my bowl down in just a second. No, I will not tilt my bowl down. I'll tilt the camera down. That did not do much for me. Like it did not rice much. Okay, so let's hope that it does when you shape them into balls. Okay. So what we're gonna do with this is we're gonna divide this into about 12. Okay, so if you have your scale handy, let's just weigh the dough. So the dough weighs 800 grams more or less. So remember that 100 grams is a honking great big bun and 50 grams is a very dainty bun. And so what we're gonna go for now, see that's, I mean, it looks tiny, right? 100 grams looks very small in dough form, but it's actually a big, big bun. So I'm gonna go for about 75 grams. Um, so remember when you're scaling, Try to remember the order in which you cut your little pieces of dough. So I'm gonna put mine out here. And the reason is because first you cut them into bits, you know, and then we shape them. So you want to be shaping the first one you cut first because it's had the longest chance of recovery. So mine are, you know, marching across my table here. It's a bit big. Pull this down. Okay, so I'm doing 75 grams, but you can do whatever you want. If you have to distribute them to many, many, many people, you might want to just do 50 grams and have a little dainty, tiny little bun. And if you want honking great big buns, do 100. Too big. Seventy-one. Six, seven, eight, nine. <coughs> okay, so I've got ten at seventy-five, and then a little kind of runty eleventh one. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do eleven because that just seems like a good idea today. And the next thing that you, if everybody, is everybody scaled? And we have a hunt. I got 10. Um, so, okay, I've mixed the plain flour in the boiling water. Yes, it is quite stiff. The plain flour, the wheat flour mixed with water, uh, which is how you make these Hong Kong buns, that you can actually get your hands in and form into a little ball. And if you want to kind of shove it into a little, you know, cover it with plastic or whatever until it's cooled down. And that, that is because the wheat starch and the wheat gluten are very, very starchy and gloopy indeed. Okay, so dumping boiling water over wheat flour is always going to get you something very, very gloopy or something you can actually form into a ball and hold. And that's because of the starches in the wheat. And what you're doing when you dump the boiling water over it is you're kind of releasing the starches in the flour to form that starchy mass, like chewing gum that you add to the dough. Yeah? Cool. So if everybody is now kind of, you've got your buns marching across, you want to have your baking tray ready, okay? Because you're going to immediately place these on a baking tray and let them rest. So remember, now this is not, you don't need any flour. 
on your table. This dough is not remotely as soft and fragile as some of the doughs we've dealt with. So you can shape this in one of two ways. You can simply take this ball and remember you have your little hand like, like a claw. You put it over your bun. You let it touch the palm of your hand and technically what you're doing, and you'll find yourself doing this, is you're technically pushing with your thumb and pulling with your finger, your small finger, okay? Your hand is going counterclockwise. And the dough is going to roll clockwise. You are wrapping the surface of the dough around itself to make a very tight ball. The bottom of the dough stays on the table, okay? And the, it winds itself up. The table acts like a screw, okay? So you're not rolling it over, you're rolling it around. If you had a little pebble or a seed right on the top of your bun, that's where it would stay, okay? So I'm gonna show you this. When you look at it, see there's the bottom. I can increase the light on that and it's kind of swirly whirly on the bottom, okay? And then once you've done it, just place it on your tray like that, okay? So that's the way number one of shaping a bun. The other way, pick up a blob, put it face down, okay? So first way is keep it bottom down. Second way, invert it, put it face down. And now we're going to stretch gently and fold, okay, just a few times around the bun. Okay, what? this is point number two. And then you're gonna kind of use your scraper, flip it over, and then you can use two hands okay. to gather the dough around itself. Now, this one you may stick to. So you need to do this one more quickly, but you notice what I'm anchoring the bun with my thumb and then moving my fingers to shape it. Now, what I wanna show you is I really, really, I'm gonna to stick to this one and, and I don't want you to stick to yours, but your fingers start out on the side of the bun here. And as you rotate the bun, they actually meet under the bottom of the bun. That's how you wrap the dough around itself. Okay, now I'm gonna to stick to this. So let me just get the dough it's off. It's not sticky at all. Okay, so Mari, what's up? Uh, mine is not sticky at all. I... It's not sticky, oh, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to be sticking to this. <laughs> well, no, if you do it in super slow-mo, you will stick. Okay, so for those of you who play the piano, doing two at one time is easy because you are used to your right hand and your left hand doing different things. A great reason to learn to play the piano. Can you wait till I'm done here? Okay, so two more. So let me just get some of these done and then I'll demonstrate the both methods for you again. Okay. So method one, Pick up a dough ball, pick up a blob, and keep it face side down. As, just move it to your middle. Make your claw, the surface of the bun touches the palm of your hand, and you just rotate. <laughs> this is why you don't, you can't have any flour down on the surface for this. If you have flour, you'll just slide around mm -hmm. on, on your countertop, and you won't be able to get the buns into a super tight ball. And as you remember, you need the buns to be in a tight ball so that they maintain their shape and they have the best chance of rising. The carbon dioxide that the yeast is emitting has to push against a membrane in order to help it expand. Like a balloon, think of a balloon, right? You blow into a balloon, the membrane of the balloon allows for expansion. You can't blow up a Kleenex, right? It doesn't expand. The wind just will whistle right through Kleenex. So you have to give surface structure to your bread so that the CO2 has something to push against to help it expand. 
you could let this sit like this unshaped, okay? And it could sit here for another 30 minutes and it could go in the oven and it won't change shape because there is nothing for the CO2 to push against. There's no surface structure. Imagine it's full of very big holes. So the CO2 just whistles right through. And when you shape it, okay, so you create the surface structure, you're tightening all of those holes so that the CO2 can help it expand. So that's kind of the science of it, of why is shaping so important. So shaping is not just about the visual shape, although that's important. It's also about helping the dough expand to its maximum. Okay, now the other way, okay, this is the other way of shaping. You pick up your blob and turn it over. So the dry side is down. Whoops, do a couple of stretch and folds. Okay, roll it over. And then with two hands, you do this. Okay, anchor it with your thumb and use your small fingers to shape it. And your fingers are drawing the dough down and around the bottom. Okay, that's a little bit slower, so I don't tend to do it. But if it helps you get like nice, nice, nice little round balls, then that's perfect, okay? So there are my 11 little balls. And what I'm gonna do with this is we're gonna push it aside, cover it with a tea towel and let them just sit for half an hour, okay? So they can sit here. Tea towel, like that. Okay, now let's bait and switch for those of you who've done the scalded rye. Okay, so pull the scalded rye out and let me just pause for a second. How's everybody doing? That's not okay. scalded rye. We've got a chat. Okay, great. How's everybody doing? Everybody fine? Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. I'd like to hear yeah. it. Yeah, I'm just waiting to see what you do with it before I turn it out and annihilate oh, my kitchen okay, workshop. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> Jim, how nice to see you. It's very nice to see Jim joining us. Hi, Jim. And it's very nice to see Bob and Amy. Jeanette, you're not baking. Was it too early for you? Jeanette, you're on mute. I didn't read the recipe last night. <laughs> okay, always read the recipe. Yes, <laughs> I will. But okay. I'm gonna make it. Oh, make it. Joined us. oh, Tom, how delightful. Are you making with us today? Uh, I've got the rye ready. Yes, it's sort of, yeah, pretty sticky. And it hasn't, I don't know if it's, well, I suppose it's had two hours now, but um, I hope it's um, going to be all right. Yeah, it's I'm sure it'll be fine. It's Thanks. always been. Sabine, how nice to see you. Nice Freezing to see you too. in your kitchen as ever. Okay, so let me tilt this down. And I actually divided the recipe in half. Okay, it's a big recipe. You can always divide things in half or double them if you feel like you're not going to want 12 bagels, you're going to want 24. You can always double or half the recipe. So I'm actually going to, again, let me just show you. So this weighs. Right, this dough is 708. And some of you may have done the whole recipe, so you'll have about 1400. So 1 1.4 kilos. You may wanna divide that into three, or you may wanna divide it into two. Anything smaller has a crust to crumb ratio that isn't great for this bread. Okay, that's another thing to think about when you're doing buns is what's the crust to crumb ratio. And I know that sounds completely nerdy, but actually it's a really important part of what it feels like to have the bun in your mouth, which the foodie people call mouthfeel, mm -hmm. which is just a bit of a weird poncy word for what does it feel like when it's in your mouth. So it's a really interesting thing. If you have something with a very, very soft crust, like a brioche or a bridge roll, it's okay to have teeny tiny, you know, 50 gram morsels of delight. But some dough doesn't lend itself 
to 50 gram morsels of delight. And in fact, if you were to put this skull de gras in a 50 gram morsel, it would be more like a bullet than a 50 gram morsel of delight. Okay, so not what we're aiming for. So with this 700, I will actually leave this as one. Okay, but if you want to divide your 1.4 kilos into two or three, that knock yourself out. I wouldn't go much smaller than three pieces because that's quite a nice size, right? It's just less than 500 grams per loaf. Um, so that would be my thought. So here's my dough. So, so Jane, do you think it's better dividing it into two rather than three? How much have you got? Did you make the full recipe? Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, basically, it, it sort of depends. I would say two or three, perfectly fine. And it depends on, on how many you want to freeze, if you want to freeze any, how many people are there to eat it, given it's lockdown. Uh, are two, there any people that you us. can give it away to? Can you give one of them away to a lovely neighbor? Uh, yeah. You know, then make three. Okay. So now with this one, there are plenty of ways to shape this. Okay. You can do a ball. You, and we know all about how to shape a ball. You, you I mean, this bread, you'll see, I mean, it's like this, right? It doesn't need to sit in a tin or a rising basket or a bowl or anything else. It's perfectly happy being shaped and left to its own devices to rise. So, um, I'm gonna show you a couple different ways of shaping this. And the first one. Uh, do we put flour down on this one? Nope, nope, no flour needed. Really? Jane, okay. yes. is it really sticky still? Yeah. Okay, um, probably you're right, probably because I took mine out and sort of demonstrated how to knead with it, it's dried off a bit. But if it's super sticky, I still don't want you to put flour down. Okay. okay. I would rather you worked with a scraper and floured your hands than had flour on the surface. Okay. okay. That's good. So the first way I'm going to shape this, yours, right, remember that I did my kneading demonstration, so I, I pushed all the air out. So yours is going to look a little bit different than this. But one way to shape this is to use, use a scraper if you have to, okay? And you pull it and gently tug at it. Remember, you don't want to get all the air out. So don't, don't squash it flat with a rolling pin or even your hands, okay? You can, you can shape it like this. Let me get this a little bit farther out. Mine's not so flexible now because... I assaulted it earlier in the name of demo. So, right, so this is one way, don't have to do this. And you might wanna use your scraper, you can pick up one end and you fold it about two thirds of the way over the surface of the dough. Pretend it's a piece of paper that you're folding to send you know, to your lawyer. So it's an A4 or eight and a half and 11 by 11 size piece of paper. Then you take the bottom edge, pull it towards you, then mine isn't as stretchy as yours is going to be, and fold it right over the top. Okay? That is one way of shaping this. Now, why bother? Okay? The reason that you shape, as I said, it's about looks, it's about enabling the bread to rise, and it's also the stretching and folding are about elongating bubbles of air and thinning the dough membranes so that the, the, you know, there's new, the dough membranes are thinner so they can expand more easily. Think of a cheap balloon or piece of chewing gum versus a sturdy balloon, right? Easier to expand. So the thinner the membrane within reason, the easier it is to expand and um, when you stretch it, you actually, at a molecular level, introduce new air and new food to the yeast, so it can continue to function. Um, sorry, tilt you up there. And you want that to happen. So a lot of the stretching and folding is about really three things, elongating bubbles, thinning membranes, 
and allowing the yeast to get at new air and new food so it can you know perk up again and continue to work so that is one so so you know the reason you don't just pull it out and go blah 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 and put it there is once again nothing's really going to happen if you just pull it out and shape it into an oblong you want to do this stretching and folding to get it into an oblong for all the reasons that i just described okay so that is one and you can just pick this up with a scraper put it on right and leave it to do its second rise and that is if you want bread that looks like this so you can slice it into pieces and they'll be kind of you know rectangular -y. the other thing that you can do with your dough okay is you can shape it into a ball and again just flour your hands no need to flour the surface and you want to go two hands okay and what you're doing again is you're creating surface tension okay so look at my hands they start up here my the, my fingers the, these sides of my hands are not on the table okay so clock that they're not on the table my hands are together over the top of the dough and the sides of my hands where my small fingers are are nowhere near the table as you turn the dough watch my hands they're going to go down and around to the bottom right right around to the bottom and now of course i've stuck to it because i'm doing it in super slow mode but if your hands are floured and you do it you know at a reasonable paste paste pace you won't stick so just do that way now the other way and we did this last time is take your dough away from you hands in front i'm going to do it this way hand in front of the dough scraper in front of your hand and you pull it towards you and you will see that the dough wraps itself up take it away from you give it a kind of a quarter of a turn and do that the scraper picks the dough off the bottom you guide with your hand okay and again imagine there's a seed on the top and that seed does not move so a couple different ways of shaping this you can shape it like a piece of paper that is going to go into an envelope or you can mm. shape a roundy like that now once you've shaped pick it up with your scraper and what? pop it on your tray okay and i'm going to shape this one again when it's had a chance to soften up a bit because it's you know it, it wasn't really stretchy enough for me to shape it how exactly i want it but how is everybody else doing let me have a look at your dose is everybody fine any questions or concerns oh cool did somebody just drop their dough sorry <laughs> <laughs> how did we do that uh, so i'm just going to pop that over there and i'm actually going to put it back in this bowl hang on how is that okay hold on one second i am all ears in three seconds those are great yeah those are super a second everybody they look wonderful now that is Jenny. Jenny, you want to maybe have a little bit more distance between them. Between, yes, you know, uh, the, long together in the oven, it's no big deal. But you may want to just no, have no. a little bit more distance. Yeah, the moment they're just sitting on a tea towel, they have. They now need to go onto the baking tray. Okay. So, how's everybody else doing? Yeah, fine. They yeah, so good. Do ours need a bit more space as well, or? Let me find you. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, oh, Bob, yours are just looking marvelous. Good, and thank you. I'm still scrolling. I'm still scrolling. Hester. I think they probably need a little bit more space. Okay, yeah. They'll just glom on. So you might want to put them on two trays. Can you fit two trays in the oven? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so put them on two trays. If yeah. you can fit two trays in the oven. Okay, now we're going to come back to our buns. Remember our buns? 
And what you want is you want to have your buttons in front of you. And you want to have your bun top, which mine was just hanging around in a plastic bag after I mixed it together. And what I'm going to do now, let me just weigh this. So that was not very intelligent. Again, bun top, 255, I'm gonna divide by 11. So I bet Jonathan can do that in his head. Probably Sabine as well, I cannot. But um, I know that it's slightly less than 25. So the first thing that we all need to do is divide, just open that window. Um, divide your bun top into as many little pieces as you have buns. Okay? Okay. So. Two. And these you don't really, you don't have to worry about the order of events here because there's no beast in this. Jane. Yes. Can I put my rye ones in the, in the oven? Uh, no, they have to rise. Again. Oh, yes. Yes, it has to do a second rise. Ah. So all bread, most bread, needs to do a first rise in the bowl, and then it gets shaped, and then it has to rise again in its shape. So we are waiting for that time to pass. And it will be probably, it depends on how cold your kitchen is. It may be 45 minutes minimum, uh, but it may be an hour, right? If you've got a freezing cold kitchen, it may be a little bit longer. And I did mine, I did mine earlier only, so. Well, you shaped it earlier? Yeah. Oh, then I have no idea. When did you shape it, Bean? Yeah, oh, like three hours ago. You shaped it three hours ago? Yeah. Okay, then yes, I would, I would put it in the oven. Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, so I have got eleven little pieces. And I'm not happy with, okay, some of my little pieces, I'm going to show you what I'm not happy with, with some of my little pieces, because you might have this as well. So, can you see here some little white dots? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those are baking powder that yeah. has balled up and it didn't get mixed in. I don't like that because baking powder has a terrible taste. So if you see any little dots of baking powder, get in there with your hands. You're going to get sticky because it's very buttery and eggy and squash them to death. Okay, you can even pull them out and, and, and rub them between your fingers. You do not want little balls of baking powder because they taste nasty. Um, indeed. Yes, nasty indeed, just full on alkaline. And I don't like that. So blobs of butter, perfectly delicious. If you see any blobs of baking powder having cut up your bun top, just sort of squash them between your fingers, really rub them between your fingers and then mix them back in. Yeah, not nice. Not nice at all. Okay, see, a, oh, see there's like a great big honking one in there. How did that get away from the mixer? Look. Anybody who got a mouthful of that would be deeply, deeply, deeply cross. And that is not our objective. Okay, so if you have found and squashed your any baking powdery little pellets, I have done. What you want to do now is just leave these. Now, I'm going to sort of do a bit of a 
sacrifice right. here because can i just come back to you again um i, I just mixed up the, the topping did you say that we need to glaze that or we just put the topping on and that's it for now well for now we're just going to put the topping on but before you anybody puts the topping on you want to wait half an hour okay between the shaping of your buns and putting the topping on so we're probably a little bit early so if you're really following the recipe properly you want to wait half an hour okay. um we're a little bit early for that so maybe you just want to wait a little bit to see if you have more time to go right in or before you do this next bit so it's so i'm going to kind of sacrifice mine so i can just show you what you need to do but for those of you who need to wait a little bit please do because the bun will be the better for it so here are my buns and what I'm going to do is I'm going to wet my hands because this is super sticky and if it is if your hands are wet it's easier to deal with okay now don't don't like completely soak your hands okay because you don't want to uh, there's another yeah. ball wait I found another ball. I'm going to put another one I'm going to pick up another one I keep finding these terrible balls of baking powder okay here we go so with wet hands, and look, if you want these to look like super, and we did this before, what did we top? We topped something and I, we rolled, oh, I know, the, um, the Rosca. Yeah. So you can always roll this between two pieces of parchment or between two pieces of plastic. You can use a rolling pin and roll this so that it's flat and, you know, and smooth, very smooth and very thin. I quite like it a little bit fatter Okay, and I like the handmade look, but it's entirely up to you. You're going to take that and put it over the top. Okay, so I'm gonna wet my fingertips and I'm gonna do another one. Thank you, Maria. Because what you wanna do, once you've topped them all, you actually want to squash them flat. I really do mean that, they'll bounce back, okay? So once you've done them, you want to literally, see how I'm squashing it? Super like a hamburger bun, flat. Why, why do you do this? Well, you may ask. It's another way of helping the bun rise even more, okay? Believe it or not, when you squish it like this, it's called degassing. It's a technical word. And degassing gets rid of the old CO2 that has been created by the yeast, moves the yeast and all of the ingredients around at a molecular level so that the yeast has new food to feed on and can get back to life again. So your buns are going to spring back and be better than ever for the squashing that you do at this point. How then long you, how long do you leave them after you've squashed them um can't remember what the recipe says let me have a little look it is, well i guess I, I can look at that yeah yeah and but you leave them for the, the amount of time that you have to leave them and then you squash them again okay before they go in the oven and oh. they're going to look sad and pitiful and you'll be cursing me curses but they will spring back in the oven and be better than ever. So there is a reason for, we're now gonna call it degassing because we all know what that means now, squashing. And that is to enable the yeast to continue to work. Okay. Uh, so is everybody kind of finding this quite fun? I find it quite, fun to do this it's a little bit like playing with play-doh yeah yeah it's like playing with play-doh isn't it i heard that do you like playing with play-doh i quite love play-doh i suppose that's why i bake it's like the grown-ups play-doh version mm -hmm. yes yeah absolutely does anyone else like playing with play-doh or did anyone else like playing with play-doh yeah yes yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Distress. There are some people who do not like playing with Play-Doh and who do not like the feeling of dough. 
I've had some people in my class who just, who can't, who can't bear it. Like they're desperate to learn how to make bread, but they can't bear the feeling of dough. Oh my gosh. One, two, oh yeah, perfect. And so um, I always, well, I think I've, we've talked about this before. I, um, now it's yep. very, very normal for people to have surgical gloves in their house. You know, before COVID it was not. Um, but yeah, I always had surgical gloves for the people who cannot bear to touch dough. And that was great because it meant that they could bake bread without having to kind of physically come in contact with the dough. Um, could they eat it? Sorry? Could they eat it? What, dough or bread? The bread. Yeah, yeah, they just didn't like the feeling of dough. Okay. So there were people who, you know, maybe had never made bread before in their lives. And then they were like, oh, but I love bread and I love good bread and I want to learn how to make it. And then for the first time, they actually discovered that they hated touching the dough. Because, you know, if you've never touched dough, you wouldn't know whether or not you liked it. Okay, so they're all my buns, my pineapple buns with their bun tops. And I have squashed them all down like that. And I'm now going to just let them sit uncovered uh, for whatever the recipe says. Somebody reminded me, it was like 20 minutes. And how are we doing here? Okay, this is my rye. Just gonna show you again. Let's have a little bit of time to rest now. And so I'm just literally going to do this to it to shape it into a ball to, um, cause remember I told you I didn't like the shape before cause it wasn't stretchy enough. Okay, so that is perfectly good for me. I'm gonna now let, put this over here and let it rise. Oops. So before, so these buns are going to sit for 15. Your scalded rye is going to sit for as long as the recipe told you, can't remember without offhand, uh, but an hour. an hour, okay. And so Sabine, I'm fascinated that yours has been hanging around for three hours, but maybe you're- I, I, I did it this morning, that's why. Ah, okay. I was making, and, I'm making a so. Right, so before the pineapple buns go into the oven, you have a choice and a chore. The choice is you can take a very sharp knife I'll kind of show you. Um, okay, you can take a super sharp knife like this and you can, if you want, do this just before they go in the oven. Don't do this now. You can cut a diamond pattern into the t your bun top. Okay, it's, the reason that you don't want to do it now is you sort of want it to dry out slightly, which it will do when it sits for 15 minutes. Okay, so super sharp knife, cut a diamond pattern that looks a bit like, you know, the outside of a pineapple. Okay, you have a choice. You can do that or not. You do not have to do that. But apparently, the myth says, um, although people with Asian ancestry may refute it, which would be perfectly fine, but the myth says this is how they got their name, pineapple buns, not because they have ever had pineapple in them, okay? So you can do this, and I'll show you what that looks like, the scoring. So there's mm -hmm. that crisp, that kind of diamond pattern. Mm -hmm. And you also want to give them an egg wash just before they go in the oven, and you want to squash them again. So you're going to egg wash, squash in the oven for around 15 minutes. Okay, so, they might take a little longer, even with a bun, you can pick one up and tap the bottom. It should sound hollow when it's done. If it sounds like a Tupperware full of mashed potato, pop it back in the oven. If it sounds like a snare drum, it's probably done. If it feels light and the texture is thin rather than thuddy, then uh, ready to come out. Always remember with buns, you've got a sweet bun with a sweet top. You're going to put an egg wash on that's going to have sugar in it. You can also use milk to do your wash. You don't need to burn another egg. Milk has sugar in it. So you wanna check them after about 10 minutes. 
make sure that they don't go more brown than you want them to go. They should be a nice dark golden color. If they are already that, cover them with a piece of uh, you know, parchment or in extremis aluminum, although parchment's better because it doesn't get hot. So, bake sorry, in a gas I... oven, bake as high as you can. Okay, get away from that heat source. You know you have very strong bottom heat source, bake as high as you can. You can always cover things from the top. It's hard to prevent things from burning from the bottom. So those are your Hong Kong buns. Okay, remember, so you're gonna wait for 15 minutes, score if you want, definitely do the egg wash or the milk wash, squash and bake. For your rye, you're gonna leave it an hour. It'll visibly change. And if you want to, you know, yeah. spray that with some water and a plant sprayer and decorate it with some seeds or some oats, or even just sprinkle some rye flour over it, pop it in the oven and bake. So Jane, can you just say that again? When do you put the seeds? I've made, I've just made the rye bread. I've made three, three rolls. When do I put the seeds on top? At the very last minute, just before you put it in the oven. And what was that about water? So you put a little bit of water on the top and then put the seeds on? Mm -hmm. Yes, otherwise they're not gonna stick. They'll just roll right off. Okay, okay. So if you have a plant sprayer, literally spray the bread with a plant sprayer, decorate with seeds or oats or whatever you want, and then spray it again with the plant sprayer so that it, they stick to the, to the loaf. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. good. So, any more for any more? Any more questions? Let's have a look at what you've done so far. So, everybody hold up their loaves. Let's have a wee look. Beautiful. Those I actually cool. prepped on Friday night and baked yesterday. Oh, okay. Oh, those, and how did they taste, Carolyn? Even better today. <laughs> Excellent. And my this father was having some this morning for breakfast. Did he like it? Yes. That's fantastic. Mark? How's anyone else doing? We put seeds on those too early. Oh, Clint and Jude, look at those deco. That's okay. Just just do it again because they'll they'll you know they'll move. So just do it again. Janet, yes. those look beautiful. Everybody. Okay, Jonathan, did you bake today or Oh no, we didn't bake today. It was very <laughs> we didn't wake up early enough. <laughs> okay, well never mind. So how was the Hong Kong bun listening experience versus the actual doing experience? Babe. Well, that's, that's very interesting. I definitely learned, I definitely learned a lot. About the pressing down of the bun technique, allowing it to rise multiple times. That I've, something new that I've learned. Great, excellent. Okay, Tom, looking um, excellent. Very nice. Yeah, that's uh, growing a bit. <laughs> I'm hoping um, that you're not going to bake in the microwave, just saying. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I'm ashamed that there's a microwave here, but it, it's, uh, yeah, purely there's for There's no people. judgment here, Tom. There's no judgment here. <laughs> microwave is very useful for heating up milk, for example. Yeah, yeah. Melting butter if you're quick. <laughs> exactly. Okay, well, look, everybody. Um, so lovely to see you all again today. Thank you so much for joining. Thank um, you. I have some ideas Thank for next you. week. I think we may stay in Scandinavia next week, you know, just because it's the Northern Lights are on at the moment. And there's a lovely winter wonderland up in Scandinavia. So I think we might spend an extra week up in Scandinavia. And, mm -hmm. you know, we can look at the Northern Lights and go tobogganing and go skiing and bake some more Scandi bread next week. Great. Thank you. Right. Okay, yeah. everybody. Thank you. Thanks Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye bye. Bye, bye. bye now. Bye. 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 Thank you, Jane. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for Bye, everyone.